If you've watched my Welcome to my channel video, you might recall me talking about reasons why stories are so important to us. How they can be, pres be prescriptive, how they can serve as cautionary tales, how they can give us perspectives we might never have considered before. But a couple of the very most important reasons why readers pick up books is A, to be entertained, and B, because they want to experience strong emotions without actually being in any danger or leaving the comfort of their own home. For example, you could feel the giddiness and excitement of first love without actually being in danger of having your heart broken. We could feel that sense of adventure and curiosity and excitement of exploring a new place without actually even the comfort of our couch. We can experience that fear and adrenaline rush of being hunted by a monster without actually leaving the safety of our own home. So that's what we want as readers. As authors though, how do we give that to our audience? Well, in today's video, I'm going to review a book that touches on that exact topic. So stay tuned. Hello everyone, I'm Sherry for The Mythic Quill. I remember when I was young, I was always a big reader, but there's this one time that I really remember strongly. I was probably 12 or 13, uh, maybe grade seven or eight, and I was reading a book at night when I was supposed to be sleeping. So of course my mom had come, made sure I was in bed, um, and told me to put my book away. But of course I snuck it out and kept reading, because you know, it's reading, that doesn't make any noise, she's not gonna find out, right? But then there was something in the book that struck me as really funny, like seriously funny. And I started laughing. And I laughed so hard that I started to cry. So here I am in my bed, barely breathing how, how hard I'm laughing and tears are running down my eyes. And next thing you know, my mom is running in the room all out going, oh my God, what's wrong, what's wrong? Because she thought there was something wrong with me and something happened. And of course it took me a while to calm down enough to tell her nothing, I was just laughing and, and there was nothing actually happened. And of course she was quite annoyed by that. And after that time, she made sure, of course, that I make, my book was away and I was not reading after, after it was time to go to bed. So what is the purpose of that? Well, it kind of illustrates the point of today's book. So I'm going to do a book review on a book called The Emotional Craft of Fiction, How to Write the Story Beneath the Surface by Donald Mass. So I finished reading this uh, actually a couple weeks ago, so I hadn't gotten around to uh, posting my review yet. But this book is centered around the theme that the books that readers remember the most, um, that affect the readers the most, are the ones that provoke a strong emotional response in the readers. It provides advice and examples for how to go beyond the, the surface level and dig deeper to create well-rounded characters that the reader can, can actually identify with. In this book, Mass uh, states that it's not just enough to name the feeling. It's just saying she was angry. That doesn't really evoke any emotions with us with the reader. So we have to dig deeper and get to underneath it. And we can use things like um, their actions and reactions to, to illustrate what's going on. This can increase engagement and your reader's emotional investment in your story. The author speaks of digging deep down into that, the level where if it were real life, you'd be so mixed up by conflicting emotions and troubled thoughts that you wouldn't know how to describe it. And this brings in mind like uh, back in April was the anniversary of my mom's death and my aunts texted me and I didn't text back, not because I didn't want to talk to them, but because I did not know how to express how I was, how I was feeling. So trying to get those kind of emotions and describe those kind of emotions and evoke those emotions in our readers, well, that's the trick. So how do you express such a tangle of emotions in writing? So according to Mass, you could do that in a number of ways, such as using comparison, description, analogy, um, anecdotes, and so on. One thing I really liked about this book that he talked about, uh, you know, going beneath to the layers. Um, but he actually used examples from books, the concrete examples from other books to help the author as reader um, figure out how to do that. So that was really helpful to me. I felt that sometimes the ideas are kind of up in the air, but they're not concrete enough to actually absorb. So I'm going to read a selection from the book just to kind of give you an example of how that works. So in this section, Mass is talking about connecting the inner and outer journey. And of course, he goes through a big explanation of how to do that, but then he starts talking about his example first. So he kind of introduces his example. Um, and I'll read a part of what he wrote for, for us. So, L.A. Meyer's young adult adventure story, Bloody Jack, 2002, was inspired by 19th century songs about young girls dressed up as boys going to sea. The songs concerned girls following boys, but Meyer wondered what would it be like for a girl to get on board a British warship just to eat regularly. 
So he relocated his story to the London slums in the late 1700s and created an orphan named Mary. So I'm going to skip a little bit. And then because she can read, Mary wins a berth on the ancient CS Dolphin as a school teacher's assistant. In his novel's opening, though, Meyer tackles the task of convincing his readers that this is something that a girl of the time would do. After Mary takes Charlie's clothes, she chops her hair short to disguise and protect herself, and soon is hailed by a gentleman to hold his horse while he dines in a tavern. For her trouble, he gives her a penny. So that's his description of it, and here is the example from the book itself. When he gets on his horse and leaves, I heads into the same tavern, and for me penny, I gets a bowl of stew and a bit of bread, which is something wonderful. I licks the bowl clean, tucks the bread in me vest for later, wipes my mouth on me sleeve, and heads out. It's easier being a boy, I reflex. It's easier being a boy, because nobody bothers with you. Like, I couldn't have gone into that tavern yesterday as a girl, because they would have shouted, Get out of here, you filthy girl! Well, they didn't say anything when I went, went in as a filthy boy. My filthy penny was as good as anybody else's. It's easier being a boy, because no one remarks about me being alone. Lots of boys are alone, but girls are never alone. The girl gets scooped up into begging and stealing gangs, or workhouses, or worse. True, on my journey south, I was eyed by some gentlemen of the street who thought as they would look better in me vest than me. But a flash of me ship put some caution in them, and that was that. It's easier being a boy, because when someone needs something done like holding a horse, they always pick a boy because they think the dumbest boy would be better at it than the brightest girl, which is stupid, but there you are. It's easier being a boy, because I don't have to look out for no one but me. I'm feeling a great sense of freedom, like a weight's been lifted from my shoulders as I'm darting my way down to the docks. I'm feeling a little ashamed for feeling so light, too, what with Charlie dead and me leaving the others and all. But that's the way it is. I slips between two loose boards into a stable that's closed all up for the night, and I burrows in the warm and sweet-smelling hay. I decide my name will be Jack. So I go back to him talking about that selection. Mary slash Jack's journey takes her from girl to boy, and then back again. Does a plot demand this, or is her voyage at sea a consequence of her decision to switch genders? It's hard to say, but there's no doubt that the two necessities, outer survival and inner need, come together in this moment. Even in a simply written swashbuckling children's adventure tale, the inner and outer journeys join. As a result, we can easily buy into both Mary's gender switch and the highly entertaining naval adventure upon which she marks. And of course, her descriptions in that example too, she doesn't just say, I feel that this is unjust or whatever. She's giving like solid examples, which help pull us into the story more and kind of have us experience what she's feeling and why she's feeling it. So I really like that part of the book where he's using solid examples to illustrate his points. But one thing I didn't really like is that a character driven story could not like could not have a plot. Um, but of course, I've read lots of other books. And of course, when you're reading about writing, you're going to have lots of different perspectives and lots of different point of views because certain things will work for some people, not for others. But I've read a couple of different books now that I'm really uh, fans of that have talked about character and plot being intertwined. So I'm going to give you an example of a couple. So first of all, I'm actually a student of the story grid and I've done a couple of courses and read the book and all. Uh, I'm just going to read to you a little bit about what he says here. Oh, and the author of this book is Sean Coyne. So, what comes first when you set out to tell a story? The kind of plot you want to tell or the lead character you have in mind? This question is the equivalent of that old debate about whether something is plot driven or character driven. The distinction is meaningless really, as the character's actions are what determine the plot and the plot is the sum total of a character's actions. And this idea is repeated um, and illustrated in this book, Creating Character Arcs by Cam Wyland. And as you see, I have like papers and stuff shoved everywhere here. So I've used this a fair bit, um, but I'll read to you a little bit about what she says about it. On page 15 in a section called the link between character arcs and story structure, she says, too often character and plot are viewed as separate entities to the point that we often pit them against each other, trying to determine which is more important, but nothing could be further from the truth. Plot and character are integral to one another. Remove either one from the equation or even just try to approach them as if they were independent of one another and you risk creating a story that may have awesome parts, but which will not be an awesome whole. So when Mass talks about a character-driven story not having a plot, what comes to mind um, to me is how in this book she talks about uh, characters having a positive change arc, where they change for the better by the end of the story, a negative change arc, where they uh, change for the worse, and then there's a flat arc, which in which a character doesn't change, either for the better or the worse. 
And from what he describes in his book, Mass seems to be describing that flat arc where the character doesn't change at all. Uh, but that doesn't mean the story doesn't have a plot. It just means that it's a flat arc. So because it's a flat character arc, the arc for the plot is the same, it's flat. Not, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about plot-driven versus character-driven stories. Um, and do you think one can exist without the other? And do you think one is more important than the other? I'm also going to post that question on my Instagram feed and hopefully if we get enough responses, I'll be able to discuss that in the next video. If you have any comments, questions, or anything you want to add, please put it in the comment section below. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you would like this content and you'd like to see more like it, then please hit the subscribe button. And if you hit the bell icon, you'll be notified the next time I post a video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.